Welcome everyone to the MMA Viva section with me, Zane Simon, and my co-host, Connor Rebush. We are here talking about UFC 227 this week in Los Angeles, California. A good, a good solid, fun pay-per-view card that I, I, I don't know, I feel like... I think maybe people are starting to get a little excited about it, but definitely a few weeks out, it felt like people were just like, oh, this is, I don't care. And I don't know. I, I'm getting more and more the feeling that everybody, th there's so much apathy to just the brand now that even good fights are not getting any any love at all. Yeah, I get the same impression. I mean, there's there's always the fact that like even a good segment of hardcore fans are going to refuse to show up for for Mighty Mouse alone, mm -hmm. um, which you know is is its own issue, which we've we've talked about tangentially many times at least. But even like Dillashaw Garbrandt was was hailed as like an incredible matchup the first time it happened, and everyone remembers it as short as it was as being yeah. a really like tightly contested a, a elite kind of fight. Mm -hmm. it's like eh. i mean granted the undercard to this is let's be real they've, they've got they've got several like dana white's contender series people on here which uh cool that's a great vehicle i think for developing up and comers maybe not for a pay-per-view um is where you put those debuting contenders you found on that show maybe that's what fight night cards are for but you know like this is what it's going to be going forward. So, like, get, get, get used to it. You're going to have to have just two good fights. And for my money, at the very least, Johnson Cejudo and Dillashaw Garbrandt are two of the most compelling matchups, rematches, you could possibly put next to each other as the main and co-main of a card. We have Cejudo, who was, like, supposed to be the toughest challenge, got wiped out, and now he looks like he's ready to be the toughest challenge. And Garbrandt Dillashaw, like, it still feels like there's so much more we could have seen out of that matchup. So... I'm hyped. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a fine card to me for, for what it's yeah. for, which is to showcase it, some of the best little fighters in the world. It, it, it's one of those things where, like, at some point, you kind of have to realize, even for your own, if for nobody else's sake than your own, that UFC cards are going to turn into boxing cards, especially their pay-per-view cards, and especially their big, you know, even that big Fox card they had the other week. And that in reality... If you, especially if you're one of those fight fans who is like constantly like, oh, you never know, all cards are gonna be good cards, and you know this shitty McChitterson versus Punchy McPunchress and fight night in Hamburg is going to be like, yeah. you never know, it could blow your mind. You got to show up. If you're that dude, then you have to be a, you have to realize that a bit like a pay per view with a a fight that you really feel like you need to see on it or two fights you really need to see on it is about as like, that's still just as worth showing up for as something that had five fights you thought you would really want to see because that's what you're going to get. Like the, you're not going to see Dillashaw Garbrandt or DJ Cejudo off pay-per-view anymore. So you kind of have to resign yourself to the idea of like, well, I'm showing up for this as as a pay-per-view. I, I want to see these fights, so that's what I show up for. And I've always argued that every other fight is good and equal, so you just have to resign yourself to that. And if you've always and if you've been of the mind that you know a, a UFC card has to be deep top to bottom, and otherwise it's not worth the time, then welcome to a new reality and probably go find something else to do because. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah. Like, like we, we say this so many times, and uh, sometimes it's not true, but like, uh, what kind of action does this lineup promise? It'll be cool. It'll be fun to watch. Like, yeah, I, I know maybe you're not showing up to a pay per view for Pedro Munoz and Brett Johns, but that's a enticing bantamweight fight that's probably going to be yeah. fun as hell. And like, I know people don't give a shit about Hikaru Hamas versus Kyung Ho Kong, but. That's going to be a blast to watch, too. Like, these are not going to be shitty fights. So, no. It'll be fine. This is just what the cards are now. I mean, they'll probably get worse than this. They'll get more yep. top heavy than this. And that's just what the UFC wants. So, yeah. And it's, it's just kind of, I'm still not sure why Pollyanna Viana versus JJ Aldridge is on pay per view. I will say that. Yeah. I mean, it, like, those, those, those aren't, they aren't on the, like, uh, 
move around their lineup to to get a couple of TV fights, and then you're and so you get these weird bald spots on the pay per view where you're like, yeah, but I mean, even that was like planned way out in advance. Like that was from day one. That was on pay per view. So really? yeah, Maybe I'm really like a contender. I don't know. But I, yeah, contender, I don't. Are they putting strawway contenders on pay per view either? I, well, yeah, I just, you know, even J.J. Aldrich at this point, like, she's interesting, but nobody's like, oh, J.J. Aldrich, future of the division right there. I mean, maybe her mom, but, you know. Is so she, that's, I will say that's kind of a weird fight. Yeah, but, I don't know. But otherwise, I mean, I'm not going to argue with Tiago Santos or Cub Swanson, Hanada Moicano, even if Santos is in kind of a showcase. Whatever. Point being... It's not a great card, but it's normal now. It's so, normal now, yeah. <laughs> and let's jump into the bottom here. Marlon Vera, Wuli Ji Buren. And, uh, Connor, do you have more than a minute's worth of no. sentences to say about I mean, this? Beyond your obvious Vera. love for Marlon Vera. Everyone knows I love Marlon Vera. He is, um, you know, unless, I'll say this, Zane, just to call out, to, to shout out Marlon Vera's own incredible Twitter career. Unless the judges are a pissed of shit, then uh, he should probably win this fight. Um, <laughs> he's that, sorry, that, it's hard to render a, a horrible typo-ridden sentence in spoken words. But yeah, there is. Um, he's had oh, some difficulty. Connor, apparently your volume needs to go up. People are complaining. You're not very. You're not loud enough. You which people actually, I can I can adjust you up here. So. You adjust. I'll try and get a little closer to my mic, I guess. I'll adjust you there. And also, I I realized, I remembered why I don't do the thing where you're always on screen, uh, beyond looking at your hideousness, uh -huh. um, is, yes. is, is that if I do that, I actually can't, nobody else sees me ever. Like, the, the video that gets recorded is whatever's on my screen. Incredible design choice, Google. Yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> All right. So you just look at whoever's talking at the moment. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Um is this so, am I louder now? Is this good? Okay, so uh Cheeto Vera, he's had some ups and downs. His real difficulty has been, I think I don't know, just trying to get comfortable. He's 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 like a slow starter. He's a young veteran and he's gonna have the problems that a young veteran has when they're not that complete a talent. Yeah. Yeah, and that yeah, that's the long and the short of it. But he does have a tendency to build and um and work yeah. on people. And Wuliji Baran is just not like offensively potent enough to that Vera is not gonna get into the mindset of starting to walk him down and starting to build and build and build his attacks. That's when he's dangerous. I think uh we'll probably end up getting a pretty impressive uh finish for Cheeto Vera. I'm thinking like a third round submission. Yeah, I mean the the basics of it is that Wuliji Buren looks like a fighter who thrived by being the best wrestler on a scene, fight scene with no wrestlers. Yeah. And Marlon Vera is a little bit susceptible to being taken down because he backs himself to the cage and lets opponents get in on his hips. But he's got pretty good takedown defense even then. Like, it's not easy. It's just he gives opportunities because of that to really good fighters. And... Even then, he's dangerous all fight. He tends to get better timing all fight and be a, you know, he, he tends to stay tough and composed all bout. So he just needs to start taking whatever Donald Cerrone was taking all these years to kind of <laughs> wake himself up in the cage a little bit, I think. Bud? Bud Light? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not the Bud that he has been taking, judging by his performances. <laughs> but, uh, oh man, you're just a laugh riot. <laughs> Yeah, so you got to go with Vera. Buren, I feel bad for him. He was going to fight Bart Kandari in a fight he almost certainly would have won, and then he yeah. fights somebody who's just going to style on him in a way that makes him look terrible. Yeah. Um, let's see, odds here. Buren is a sizable underdog, opened at plus 170, and is immediately just trended continually upwards to plus 388. Vera opened at minus 230, dropped down to minus 387, and it's trended continually downwards to minus 531. So, is this Buren's first bantamweight fight? Mm hmm. Okay. 
Well, we'll see how that goes. Could be could be a thing, but I don't think he's actually a huge featherweight. So no, I think he was. He, I mean, he he and Bart Kandare fought at featherweight, and I think it was just a battle of guys who were who were featherweights regionally and in the UFC were very much bantamweights, but had never had to cut weight to make enough to make that matter before. Mm-hmm. So. Vera's a pretty big fat or bantamweight anyway. He's he's not, you know, really strong or like muscle bound. He'll, but... he'll probably be a featherweight before his career is done. Yeah. Brings us to a woman strawweight bout, Danielle Taylor versus uh Wile Zhang. Or Wile Zhang. And uh this is kind of the same thing, honestly. I mean Taylor is not as offensively potent as Marlon Vera and much more likely to to lose a volume-based decision if uh, Zhang can just kind of stay on her and stay busy and stay composed. But you look at Zhang's regional fights and they tend to be a lot of her holding her head straight up high while throwing kicks and getting absolutely drilled by random regional Brazilian ladies they brought in to face her and then resorting to a takedown and grappling game and being just a better wrestler than them to get top position and rain down a bunch of shots. And I don't think she can take Taylor down, who's really strong and hard to control and hard to get in on her hips. And at that point, Taylor hits hard and I expect... Zhang to just kind of walk in on her a lot and kind of Jessica Penne her way out of the fight. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's possible. Like it's still possible with Taylor that she could Jessica Penne her way through the fight uh, and, and actually win because I mean, t- Taylor, yeah. ta- sure. Taylor, I think has the makings of, of quite a good young, you know, like powerful um, counter punching wrestling kind of contender, but she really did not show up in that uh, JJ Aldridge fight. She um she she really she didn't deserve the Sohi Ham decision and then right. she showed, you know, she showed that in the Aldridge fight that the improvements of the Penne fight were really just Penne walking straight forward into punches. Yeah, I mean I think there I think there were still some there were still like some mechanical improvements. The difficulty was that yeah, Aldrich is just a mechanically much better boxer. Yeah. Uh and just didn't give her the stylistic matchup she had that made her look so good last time. Um and T- Taylor could not change things up. She looked it was no. very much like a Tyron Woodley kind of issue. Yeah. Like she was just stuck expecting the kind of fight she she wanted to get and didn't know how to force it to happen. And um I guess the difference is that, yeah, you know, Zhang is going to mix it up with her. She's she's going to try to outwork her and not in the same way that Aldrich did from a safe range behind a jab using counters. Um, yeah, but she's going to walk she, into the pocket with kicks. And then if yeah. she gets hit, she's going to start swinging wild. If she yeah. doesn't get knocked out, though, like if she can yeah. take it and keeps coming and, and lands a lot of those kicks, she is a pretty powerful looking kicker. Yep. Um, she's taken some nasty shots and Taylor just didn't pull the trigger enough. So, yeah. Like if anything happens to, to weaken her confidence, I think this is the kind of matchup that John could actually. Win. Any busy fighter that fights Taylor and doesn't get hurt has a very good chance to beat her. Right. It's just the way Taylor fights. She lets everybody have that kind of opportunity. And I don't know. We'll see where she's at. I would like to see more out of Taylor. I would like to see a more disciplined focused kind of approach. But we'll see. Wei Zhang, the pro- the current odds product of some interesting hype here, opened at minus 245, dropped to minus 253, got up as high as minus 234, and has been trending back down all the way down to minus 263 right now. So that record of hers is inspiring a ton of confidence. Yeah, she was also training at... Um... I can't remember where it was. Some American camp. It was American Top Team or Jackson Wink or something like that. And uh, for Taylor, yeah. she opened at plus 175. Probably, I might guess it would be Jackson Wink, but it may be ATT. I don't know. It, a lot of the, it seems like a lot of fighters tend to end up at Jackson Wink when they, the UFC is wanting to develop them into, U, into UFC products. Mm-hmm. Um, Taylor opened at plus 175 and has, other than dipping down a little to, uh, she's basically risen the whole time. Is now plus two twelve, and 
Like, I, I, to me, that's just all people looking at Wuli Jiberen's or Wuli Zhang's record and not looking yeah. at how she fights. But yeah, to me, there is money to be made on Danielle Taylor there. I mean, it's not, I would never bet confidently on the likes of Danielle Taylor, but in this matchup, she shouldn't be a massive underdog. Yeah. Zhang does not look like as composed as JJ Aldrich or even Seo Hee Ham. And, you know, you can argue that like Ham just went out and beat, knocked out Jin Yu Frey in Road FC mm-hmm. and. Daniel Taylor supposedly technically won that fight on the judges. So she was certainly, she showed some things in that fight. I mean, she was yeah. competitive. So, all right. Um, that brings us to a flyweight bout. Jose Torres, Alex Perez. Take it away. God, when it, this is MMA has cursed me for life because when you just said Jose Torres, I, in my head, I corrected your pronunciation. I know, to to Jose Torres. I know. I'm the idiot. Um, this is this is a very good matchup. I mean, it's 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 very exciting. Jose Torres, um it it is difficult to remember. His last fight was, of course, against um, you know, uh wait, what's the guy? Jared Brooks. (laughs) Jared Brooks. I can't remember his name. I remember the GIF. Um, you, yeah, you remember the GIF. You remember the nine times out of ten I win this fight, and the other one, the other ten I don't knock myself out. Yeah, so it's hard to, it's hard to remember somewhat how the fight played out because it had such uh, an exclamation point kind of ending. But uh, yeah, Torres was actually working his way back into the fight with Jared Brooks, pretty intelligently, I think. I mean, he had a gambit sort of approach, but it was all based on pressure. Uh, it was all based on like losing early exchanges but uh managing to work that into a into an approach that would work for him down the stretch and i think it was coming into effect like people talk about how brooks was winning that fight and then he knocked himself out but i do think that uh torres was getting himself into it he was starting to land counter combinations he he was just constantly pressing forward and not giving brooks any room to breathe and uh it's a very effective kind of style against a lot of fighters, especially at flyweight. I feel like pressure is very effective against these guys who are used to their opponents agreeing to leap around at long range with them and uh, not get in their faces. I'm interested to see how that works against Alex Perez. I, I yeah. have I have it in mind that Torres is going to stay committed to that pressure, um, and I don't think he's going to be backed off. I just think that's in his style. He, he's yeah, like, he, he is. I mean, you watch to- Jose Torres regionally against worse competition, and he's all just walking people down constantly, yeah. throwing hands, looking for looking for the pressure counter game, but leading enough to, to draw it out, too. And just, you know, he's kind of got John Lineker without the body work. And without the, you know, quite quite the athletic the, the athleticism and natural power to it. But it's still, it's just a very pressure combination, pressure combination style. It's He's very syste- systematic in his approach that way. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is that Alex Perez, I mean, Alex Perez is still going to have a lot of the advantages that he had over like Eric Sheltman his last mm-hmm. year. He, he's a big flyweight. Yep. Um, he is a very powerful wrestler and a very skilled wrestler. I mean, that, that is, he's, he's just a great wrestler for this division. He's huge. He the thing is, is he does like to pressure himself. Mm-hmm. He likes to do it in a much like slower, more methodical kind of way. Yep. So I have the feeling that Torres is going to have some success pressuring Perez. Perez is going to be forced to fight a different game and is going to be forced to do a little more reactive wrestling. Uh, his size might still be more than enough because Torres, for all that he was working his way into the fight, he was also getting thrown all around by Jared Brooks and eating yeah. the much bigger shots and getting timed. Perez, I think, is a good enough technical fighter to time somebody like Torres coming in because Tor- Torres is, you know, for all of his, his his boons, he's not that creative with his offense. He does tend to come straight in. The head's right there. Yep. And he has to get your timing before he can start making you miss and then countering, which means he has to get hit quite a bit before he can make you miss and then start countering. Um, I am going to, I'm going to stick with Perez. I think the wrestling is just going to be a decided advantage, but I, I'm really excited about this one, actually. I think that Torres's pressure could really show us some things about Perez that we don't yet know. You know, it's possible Perez really doesn't like being pressured. It's possible that he starts to wilt a little bit or 
anything could happen because uh, Torres is going to bring it. So I'm sticking with Perez, but I, I, I like this matchup a lot. Can you turn your mic up a little more? I'm yeah, still yeah. People say I can't. They can't hear you. Turn up your computers, you idiots! I mean, <laughs> the volume well, button. But they can right hear here. me. I'm I'm appropriately volumed here. It so saying. it was just a joke. Either that, or you know, maybe they just don't want to hear me, and it's just like, no, Connor, get louder. <laughs> <laughs> I can turn the other, so we can turn it down and not hear the other guy. Is that better? My mic is like fucking maxed out. What's the? This is the same setup we use every week. Yeah, I don't know. I, I have no clue what's going on. But anyway, we'll just keep going. Okay. Uh yeah, I mean, I can't I don't disagree. I'm I'm picking Perez and I'm picking him mostly because of his size and his grappling. Yeah. And uh but I do think this is going to be especially early on very much a battle of both guys trying to establish pressure and likely Torres having a more success doing that early just because he's that's that's the only setting in which he fights. You watch like yeah. Alex Perez fight um, Eric Shelton. And it was like, I'm pressuring, but I'm kind of moving around. I'm looking for my angles. I'm going to jump in with a hook. I'm going to jump back out, create space again, then go back to moving forward. He's on the front foot, but it's a, I don't even know that I want to say crafty, but it's not a very like, it's a, it's a less process driven pressure. It's like pressure is much more insistent. Yeah, he's high yeah. high volume. He doesn't he he that is like his yeah. One goal is to get in your face. It's very yeah. much based on the idea of what pressure does to your defense. Yeah, and your like responses. He he's much more comparable, like I said, to John Lineker in that way, where it's just like, no, we go. I go forward, you go backwards. That's how a fight works. That's how I fight, and that's the only setting I have. But it does also maybe suggest that Perez is the kind of fighter who who doesn't have to pressure quite as yeah. much as Torres has to pressure. Yeah. So I, I'm going to take Perez. I'm going to take his size to win over to be able to throw Torres off his game enough and his strength and his grappling to be able to get it done. But it may be, too, a thing where, like, Perez has success early countering Torres's pressure and, like, getting big takedowns and outworking him and scrambling and grappling and then just kind of gets tired as Torres keeps walking forward and keeps walking forward and you get a split decision kind of thing where it's like, oh, Perez did really well for a round and a half and then Torres started to find his range and his timing and just kept walking him down. That is, I think what was going to happen in the third round of that Brooks fight. I really do. Yeah. So. I think that's very likely. But then you, know, but even then you have to ask, well, would Brooks have lost that fight? Like, right. If he would he have won enough of the second round to lose that decision? Right, it's hard to say. I'm picking Perez just based off that. Uh, Perez is a slight favorite, opened at minus 120, adjusted down to minus 156, and has slowly been trending back up to minus 137. Torres opened at minus 120, adjusted up to plus 130, and has slowly been trending back down to plus 113. So pretty even odds with Perez a slight favorite. I think that seems fair to me. Yeah, works for me. Uh, that brings us to a featherweight bout, Matt Sales, Shaman Marias. And um, basic dynamic here is that I like what Matt Sales is doing, but I don't trust it against Shaman Marias. Mm -hmm. Sales appears to have a very simple uh, sort of use when necessary wrestling game with a little top control and a little kind of basic guard work ground and pound. And otherwise is just a very composed pot shotting boxer. Like I'm just going to stay outside. I'm going to look for my spots. I'm going to throw, you know, throw lead uppercuts, throw hooks, not a real deep combination game. A lot of, lot of single right hands. A lot of single right hands, but accurate, powerful, and doesn't throw himself into the pocket where he gets then taken out of his preferred range. Mm -hmm. Um, But Shaman Marias is a much more creative, diverse talent. He can tend to club and wing his hooks a bit when he gets pressured and or when he really wants to try and like push someone back, he'll 
to kind of get that Renato Moicano classic Brazilian sort of, I'm just going to throw my arm at you stiff and we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, but he attacks the body at range. He'll jab and throw long strikes to the body. He's a great body kicker and just a great kicker in general. And he, you know, it means he has three layers of offense he can work. He'll work a powerful low kick game. He'll work a long range body punching, body kicking game, and then he'll throw strikes to the head. And if sales can't get him down and keep him down, it means that sales is going to be de- dealing with three layers of attack while he only returns with one. Yeah. And I got to take Marias in that fight. Yeah. It's going to be, I think everywhere this fight goes, the layers are going to be the difference. Marias is, um, he's not much more experienced in terms of numbers, but he has certainly fought the better competition. Um, and I mean, for, as far as I just think sales is just a little outmatched everywhere here. Like, I just don't think he's quite ready for this kind of opponent. He's, as you noted, his striking is very much based on single shots. Um, they're, they're generally well placed. They're quick. Uh, he's got some good timing. And he, he does give the impression of being like more creative with his strike selection than he is because he's a little tricky with his rhythm. He will uh-huh. put pot shot in a very um, sneaky kind of way. But it's generally one shot at a time. And anytime he exchanges with Shama Morais, I have a hard time believing he's going to be immediately ready for the, the next levels of attacks that are going to be coming following the, the exchange of first strikes. Uh, where Morais starts following him with the kicks, where Morais starts, and on the ground as well, I just think Sales is a little too lackadaisical for a really explosive aggressive submission grappler like Marais. I in fact I think Marais might have his biggest advantage there on the ground. Uh but it depends on how he approaches the feet. I think he could he could we could start slow if he if he wants to like let sales work a little bit. Where really I think Marais could probably shock sales if he wanted to and come out and just start hitting him and have some early Yeah. Success. I mean sales greatest at, he, he, the best thing that benefits him is that Marais is a pretty low paced striker. Yeah. And often just tends to want to throw single shots himself. He doesn't, you know, he looks to be on the outside and try and pick you off with kicks and throw the occasional long strike. And then, you know, if he really feels like he has an opening, he'll wing a few wild strikes at you and get a little, sit down on something a little more. But that'll be the biggest benefit to sales. Yeah. And either way, I I think like... Morais's approach is just going to give him more options at the yep. range and pace that Sales wants early, and his whole skill set gives him more options as the fight envelops. So, uh, yep. Shame Morais for me. Uh, Morais and Sales are dead even in the odds, it's kind of surprisingly. Morais opened at minus 125, adjusted up to plus 111, and has been dropping steadily back down to minus 115. Sales opened at minus 115 got as low as minus 139 and has been rising steadily back up to minus 109. So I I'd like these to get to continue dividing towards Marias being a favorite. Like I say, I think sales is decent, but um, I guess Marias had a long layoff and then he got beaten by Zabit. Yeah. But getting like shame and Marias only two losses coming to the beat Mag- Charpov and Marlon Marias shouldn't be a big... current like top. Yeah. A top, a, 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 a top prospect at featherweight and a current top three bantamweight. Yeah. Like yeah. sales just ha- doesn't sales has a split decision loss to some dude and otherwise nothing like that kind of competition. Yeah. I was watch- like watching his regional fights. You know, there were a couple bouts in there where you're like, this guy, you know, the, the, this guy is just not good. Like, or, you know, in his in his fight that he had where, uh, oh, what was it? The one that he lost by split decision. Something Hickman? Yeah, Hickman. Like, he, he went to the ground with Hickman after Hickman slipped or after he might, I think he might have knocked him down or something. And then Hickman just out grappled him for a round. Yeah. You know, I saw that. I was like, Ooh, Shaman Marais' jujitsu is, I mean, it, it didn't look that great against Zabit's jujitsu. Yeah. But Zabit is a, <laughs> Zab, like wrestling is actually the best part of Zabit Mogoma Charapov's game. It's just mm-hmm. not the part that gets all the creative love because yeah. it's hard to be, look like a creative wrestler. He still manages to do it, but people yeah. don't know. 
All right, that takes us to a bantamweight bout. Ricardo Ramos, Kyung Ho Kong. And, uh, man, this this one... Wait, this is you. Yeah, this go ahead. Me. Oh, man. Um, I I like... I mean, this is going to be fun to watch. I am, I am certain of that. Uh, the big question is, for me, like... Can Kyung Ho Kong get Hikaru Hamos to the ground? That's I like that. I'm not 100 percent certain of that. What What do you think? I think he probably can. My question would be more: Can he control him there? Yeah. Can he Can he get a grappling match with him? It's yeah. Probably the better question, and because that is, I mean, that is where Kyung Ho Kong is at his best. Uh, yeah. He's, he's a very good submission grappler. Um, he is a good wrestler. He's got one of those really like dynamic takedown games. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, he's very much like a, an opportunistic kind of submission grappler on the ground Uh and and does tend to spend a lot of time in his fights, like fighting from quote unquote disadvantageous positions, being controlled, being pressured. And, And on the feet, it's a lot of like, you know, he, He's got desire. I'll give him credit for his desire, but it's he wades forward. He puts his head down, and he throws a lot of long, wide strikes that get him picked off in return. Yes, um, and he will stay there and keep exchanging if you agree to do it, and 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 uh, will turn it into a clinch or a crazy scramble. Like it's all about the just just come into my world, and then Kyung Ho Kong will have the kind of fight he wants to have with you. I guess he's kind of like a submission based brawler in some ways. Mm-hmm. He just kind of wants a free flowing scrap on the floor uh, and will scrap on the feet if he can't get it. I just don't think that Hamos, I mean, Hamos is, he's, he's up against a big challenge here. He's, he's, he's relatively inexperienced. You know, he's got, um, it hasn't faced the level, the same number of like experienced opponents that uh, Kong has. He does have that one really decent win over Michinori Tanaka, who Kong also fought and beat. Beat by split decision. Yeah. In a very narrow, very back and forth tough fight. Certainly Hamos had the better look over Tanaka. Um, it's hard to judge a ton from his win over Ayman Zahabi, who is himself a very untested, unproven um prospect kind of fighter. But you look at Hamos and he's got stable takedown defense. He's got creative striking. He moves well. He just seems to have all the right thing. Like athletically, he's got great balance. He's very quick. Uh he's got exceptional timing. Um, and he's durable too. Like he, he, yeah. he that, the Zahabi fight was not altogether easy on him, and he didn't seem shaken at any point. It's just hard to imagine Kong having a reliable path to winning this fight. I can certainly imagine a fighter as young as Hamos getting into a bad position and giving up a sort of prospect submission loss here. It seems more than likely. But yeah, uh, he's done it before. I mean, that, that the thing is that on the ground, Hikaru Hamos is really aggressive. Like he yeah. just will absolutely pursue whatever submission opportunity he sees and he's paid you know he, he's only paid for it once but he has paid for it yeah and so yeah that's a very real problem uh yeah. against kyung ho kong that's a serious risk but it, it, the fight as a whole uh, it just feels like for like 70 percent of the time hamos is going to be in control getting to do what he yeah. wants to do so I'm going yeah the the bad part for Hamos, other than his tendency to be an overaggressive grappler, is that he really does not handle pressure, striking pressure well. And that's really like, the Zahabi fight was kind of an example of, here's a very composed, well-schooled opponent who's not nearly as athletic as you. They're going to continually op- expose some of the flaws in your game yeah. But at the same time, like there were moments where Zahabi would just shoot in on Hamos's hips, and Hamos would just like push him down to the mat and be on top of him. It's like, but you're also still way more athletic than this guy, so you're just going to be able to fight your way through. Mm-hmm. And uh, this will be interesting because Kyung Ho Kong is wilder, less process driven, less well schooled, but also a lot more athletic than Iman Zahabi. So. He's not going to apply pressure as well as the hobby did, like from a technical perspective. Yeah. He might be more effective applying pressure no matter what. Yeah. So I, I'm picking Hamos too narrowly. Uh, the big thing being mostly that uh, Hamos on his feet is a pretty, com- he's a very composed offensive striker. Defensively, like I say, he has problems handling pressure. 
But when he gets the chance to pressure, he does a really good job picking powerful, dynamic strikes that fit the moment and that hurt his opponent. And Kong is just a little too, like, he's he's too open going forward and backwards. Like, there's no really good, safe place for Kyung Ho Kong. So he might be able to pressure Hamo some and get him off balance or get him into bad positions momentarily. but. Hamas is a really good scrambler on the ground. He's aggressive, sometimes to a fault, but we've only seen him that catch him out once. And, you know, it's not like Kyung Ho Kong's record isn't littered with mediocre losses. Sure. You know? He, he's, he's a good fighter, but he's not necessarily a fighter who is composed enough to win every bout, you know? No. Uh, he lost a split decision to Alex Caceres who's like the king of uncomposed wild fighters Mm -hmm. and a decision to Chico Camus too, who could just kind of shut him down and outstrike him. So I, uh, I got to pick Hamos here. I do remember that Caceres fight being very close though. Yeah, it was. Kong is a blast. He's yeah. He's just not reliable. That's all. Yeah. And you know, a, a, a close decision over, uh, Michinori Tanaka and then wins over Shinichi Shimizu and Guido Canetti don't really say, no, now he is reliable. Um, Odds on that fight. Kong is the underdog, opened at plus 175, adjusted up to plus 197, got up as high as plus 201, and has dropped since back down to plus 177 and appears to be still dropping. Hamos opened at minus 245 and has been trending right along in there for a while. And then the past uh, couple of days has jumped from minus 241 to minus 218. So late money coming in on Kyung Ho Kong, maybe. Which, I mean, Hamos being a big favorite is definitely a little, like, he's better, but he's not... um, you know, he's not so composed, especially defensively, that I'd just be like, no, Hamos has this running away, no question. Yeah, agreed, agreed. He's definitely, definitely should be favored, not too much. Brings us to a Bantamweight bout, Ricky Simon, Montel Jackson. And, um, I mean, this is a rubber meets the road fight for Montel Jackson, because watching tape on him, he could win this fight. He is a very composed, rangy pressure striker. You know, he's got absolutely a nice, tight, I am going to stay outside, put together long strikes, long kicks, and snipe you out out at range. And then if, you know, if if he has to jump in, he moves all the way in to the clinch where he can land with power and doesn't open himself up in the pocket until he has an opponent hurt. It's a very good, composed, multi-level striking game for somebody who doesn't want to do anything other than strike. (laughs) Um, But his opposition has been bad. Yeah, Like, the guys you see him doing this to regionally before his Contender Series win are just a massive athletic step down from everybody else. Yeah. From anybody in the UFC. And the, the guy he fought on the contender series, it was pretty uh, immediately apparent that he was a big athletic step above that guy too. Like he hurt him immediately and then still carried him for another two rounds. Yeah. You know? So there's like, it's a very, he's got a very strong basic striking game. It functions and it's going to win him, win him a lot of fights. But Ricky Simon is just kind of a whirlwind. Like, he's not a good striker. He tends to just kind of put his head down and wing hooks into the pocket, throw with power, and bet on his ability to be tough. He's not the most composed wrestler in the world, but he's relentless at it. He will just absolutely chase takedowns and chase power wrestling moves all fight if he can. And he's not an elite positional grappler or anything like that, but he's a very strong scrambling opportunist. So he's, and as we saw in the Merib Dvalishvili fight, 
he's not going to go away. Mm-mm. Like you can push a pace on him for 15 minutes and he will be there trying to win that fight all the way up until the last second. We just don't know that about Montel Jackson yet. Like maybe Montel Jackson can stick uh, Ricky Simon outside and just snipe him and pick him off all fight. Can land the good shots in the clinch when Simon tries to close him down for takedowns and can get back to distance and just land good long strikes. But I can't trust him to handle that kind of pressure fight that Simon's going to want. With somebody who's just waiting forward in on you relentlessly and no matter whether you hurt them, no matter whether, you know, no matter what fight you bring to them is just always going to be in your face. I haven't seen Jackson fight good enough opposition yet to be like, nah, this guy, he will absolutely shut this down and be composed. For sure. I do. I I will say I do totally expect Montel Jackson to poke Ricky Simon in the eyes (laughs) at least once, if not two or three times. Because his his response to pressure right now is absolutely just, mm-hmm. and it, it will abs. It, it, it's just you know, it, it's an eye poke waiting to happen, especially yeah. against a fighter like Simon. Yeah, I'm I'm with you across the board. Really, uh, it's hard. The, the biggest thing I want to emphasize, like it is hard to watch Ricky Simone's fight with um, Dwalish Willie and not come away thinking like, well, how's a normal kind of fighter going to beat him <laughs> because not that he's unbeatable by any means but Dualish Willie is is like a Gaethje-esque sort of dynamo you know like he he's a very tough opponent he 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 just goes balls to the wall with everything he does throws massive power huge wild shots has no fear extremely aggressive and uh I think he hurt Simone a fair few times in the beginning of that fight right like he he was giving Simone problems he was uh-huh. taking him down and simone never ever slowed down yeah I mean, it, it, that was one of the fastest paced fights i've ever seen in the first two rounds it was insane how hard these and not just the speed like the the work rate but how much power they were throwing and simone was like cartwheeling at a takedown attempt uh-huh. he was doing some crazy scrambling shit like he fought with reckless abandon i would have called it for most fighters and then the third round rolls around, and it's like, is he slightly fresher <laughs> than Dwight yeah. Willie? And he was. He 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 looks like a really, really impressive athlete. Um, and that alone is gonna be a big step up from the kind of shit that uh from the kind of shit that um now I'm blanking on the man's name. Mont- Montel Jackson. That uh, Jackson dealt with on the regional circuit. It's gonna be a big step up, as you said, from the guy he fought in Dana White's uh, contender series, Dana White's dancing with the fighters. And um, it's also like, uh, yeah, I, I want to say that like Montel Jackson, I think I, I'm also with you in saying when you say that he, he's going to have some openings in this fight. The eye pokes are definitely going to be there, but he's got like he, he does have the makings of a good fighter. He's, oh, yeah. he seems athletic. He has a really good feel, I think, for distance. He still does a lot of reaching and pawing because I don't think he has like those defensive reactions trained in. Uh-uh. But he's got good eyes. You can tell he sees things coming. He adjusts immediately. He's got the makings of a really good like pot shotter or counter fighter. Remind, reminds me a lot of Rob Font at this weight. Sure. In that yeah. way, like just like yeah, you you know the game isn't deep yet, yeah. but Rob Font wasn't when he got to the UFC. Yeah. But it's evolving, and there's power there, and there's an ability to command distance and to not get sucked into the kind of fight that your opponent wants. Yeah, and Simone does thrive on his athletic talent, not his yep. technical uh, know-how. No, so. there's no part of Simone's game where you're like, "Oh, that's that's where the real technique is." It's like yeah. you're just fucking wild man everywhere. He's just dynamic as shit, and I think that's going to be the difference. Is no matter yep. what kind of fight he gets, I don't think Jackson's going to be prepared for the just the type of shit and how much shit Ricky Simone is capable of doing. So I'm going yeah. with Ricky Simone. Simone is a very slight favorite opened at minus 199 jumped up to minus 122 and adjusted up and down and has then been rising up and down just right now minus 125 little movement but uh not a big favorite uh jackson opened at plus 175 dropped down to plus 115 and is slowly trended downward to now uh plus 101 I think 
we just haven't like yeah i haven't seen jackson face good enough fighters to justify those odds even though i like his style not at all he's six no. and zero, oh, and um nine and one Rick, rico de Shulo, the guy he fought on the contender series was far and away the best opponent he'd ever fought yeah he didn't look good yeah so. and and it, even then it like that was a fight where Jackson immediately dominated and then didn't have the compo like didn't have the depth of experience to put a guy away immediately right. instead he, or the composure he fouled him he hit him with an illegal oh, elbow and then a low times. a low kick in the in in the groin afterward so yeah there was an eye poke as well he fouled him like yep. two or three times in that fight yeah it's just he just looked like a young fighter who needs more time and it, yep that's all there is to it yep. That brings us to a bantamweight bout. Pedro Munoz, Brett Johns, take it away. Man, this is a good fight. It um, is. Pedro Munoz is, I think, just currently. Uh, you know, okay, he had the he had the loss to John Dodson. I forgot about yeah. that one. <laughs> but uh, was currently on was recently on a tear. Um, is still, I think, has proven to be a very dangerous bantamweight like yeah uh, he, he slowly climbed himself into a top 10 mainstay fighter like he's just yeah he may not be ever a title contender but he's a dude who's going to be a incredibly tough fight at the top tough, of that division tough matchup for brett johns man yeah like, john's just lost his first his first defeat to aljamain yep. sterling um a fight in which like he was definitely in it at various moments but it it, it was a kind of fight where you're like okay now we know he needs to take a step back. You know, uh -huh. he, he he clearly does not have some of these just this elite comfort and and uh, flow that Aljamain Sterling has to to fight at this level. Uh, and then he gets to fight Pedro Munoz right after that. Yeah, the the unfortunate thing that the Johns fight really, or with, that the uh, Aljo fight really exposed, is that Brett Johns, if he can't get takedowns, right, only has one other tool. And it, it leaves him as an incredibly limited fighter. Yeah, and you don't want to be. I mean, gr granted, let, let's talk about the style matchup. Like, it's yeah. going to be a very different kind of fight to the story. Oh yeah, fight. exceptionally. And Munoz is nothing but pressure and aggression, uh -huh. uh, and I mean nothing but aggression because he does not have the defense you would like to see out of a pressure fighter. Uh, no. As we've, we've discussed many times, he is a a remarkably ineffective uh, double forearm guard a remarkably ineffective high guard he doesn't mm -hmm. adjust it doesn't move his head really takes a lot of shots he i don't know he also just has this weird like there's just a predictability to his striking you know he's, oh, he's yeah. not tricky with his rhythm he doesn't change it's he throws a lot of heat and he throws a lot of volume but uh if you want to hit him while he's throwing you absolutely can do that um mm -hmm. it just takes the composure to stand in front of him the thing is it's still like a, I've never seen Brett Johns fight that kind of an opponent. I have never seen anybody oh. march Brett Johns down, chop him with low kicks, throw combinations, and on the one hand, that could be good for him because it's going to be a kind of fight where at any moment he can he can plant his feet, take a step forward, and be in a, a, a grappling engagement. Which, uh -huh. as you just noted, is, yeah, the, the thing he needs to do to win fights. And, uh, I mean, we'll see in this matchup if he's built on that game, but up to this point, he has needed to successfully out wrestle people to uh, fight them. The difficulty is that Munoz is, it's, it also means Munoz is going to be able to force Johns to make decisions. Uh -huh. It's not going to be Johns in charge of deciding when he wrestles. He's going to have lots of opportunities, but deciding how to approach them, deciding exactly when to shoot um, or when to tie up in the clinch or just how to go about it is not going to be up to him because he, he's going to have to grapple. He has to make split second decisions. And that is where Munoz really fucks grapplers up mm -hmm. because uh, it only takes them making the wrong decision and giving them, giving him their neck once for him to submit them. He has maybe the tightest guillotine in the UFC today. Uh, he's really, really dangerous with that choke. He's one of those submission artists who just gets it locked up. And two seconds later, the guy is like eyes wide tapping desperately because the squeeze is too much. And yeah, I just kind of see Pedro Munoz winning this fight because of that kind of stuff. Like, I think Johns is going to have his moments, but I don't think he's strong enough or powerful enough to scare a guy like Munoz off. And I can definitely see him having success tying up with him, but Munoz is a very capable wrestler, very powerful inside. 
And uh, I, I just think Johns is going to slip up at some point. I don't know if he's going to get submitted, but he's definitely going to be giving Munoz momentum, I think, uh, as a result of that pressure. So I'm going with Munoz. I think it'll still be close, but I think Munoz is going to take it. Yeah, I, I mean, the biggest thing here for me... What happened? Now you're quiet. Now I'm quiet. I turned my vo- my own volume down on oh. my side because now I'm trying to compensate to for you that everybody says that you're really quiet. So I've been turning my system volume way down. Why am I quiet? What's going on here? I don't know. But we got a lot of people complaining, so. Anyway. Does that make a difference? Am I louder now? Yeah, yeah. what the fuck <laughs> just happened there? <laughs> wonder if, like, a cat stepped on my mixer and, like, turned the main mix dial down. Okay. Well, there we go. Turn, let me adjust us back. <laughs> that made a difference, at least. Shit. Okay. There. Now we're back to even. Okay. We good? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, the uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that I can't pick Brett Johns in this fight because the thing that got exposed in that Aljo fight. It's not just that, like, oh, Brett Johns, once you stop him from wrestling, all he does is box, which is true. Like, he, he doesn't he doesn't have a kicking game at all. Right. It's also that, as a boxer, he has no range boxing game whatsoever. Mm. Like, he doesn't ha- cut the cage off. Johns has always been a straight-line fighter. And it was all, it's always, what's always succeeded for him as he came up the ranks was that he's jumping in on a straight line and you don't know if he's jumping in with a series of hard hooks and uppercuts or if he's jumping in on a double leg takedown. Problem here is you shut down the takedown and suddenly you have somebody who's only jumping into the pocket on a straight line, throwing hooks. It's one of those switch ups that doesn't work because you can solve either option with one move. Exactly. If I just move laterally, neither the takedown nor the punches will land. Yeah. Now, Moonhost isn't going to move laterally or, you know, <laughs> do anything tricky to that nature. But Not on the, the problem, back foot. The problem still becomes Moonhost is a dangerous enough grappler that jumping in on a takedown on him right. is usually your worst, your worst bet. Yeah. We have seen this way too many times where, you know, be it... Uh, Russell Doan, be it Justin Scoggins, be it Rob Font, jumping in to take Moonhoes down usually means you jump straight into a guillotine and he then chokes you out. And then at that point, you have Brett John stuck boxing with somebody who has a diverse kickboxing game, even if mm-hmm. it's predictable, so is Brett John's. Like a predictable boxer against a guy who's going to throw a lot more kicks and uh, to mix up with, with as well as his hooks and and straight punches, and and Munoz also throws shots like a slugger. He like, does, and if you're throwing that, at the same time. He was just going to keep throwing and assume that his shot's going to be better. Yeah, and yeah, that might get him hurt from Bet- Brett Johns, but Johns has never really been a right. knockout artist of any sort. Like that's. He's never been the kind of fighter who just absolutely cracked people. He's been, you know, he hits hard enough to make people think, to make people think, oh, is this going to be a hook now or is this going to be a double leg? But I don't, you know, Moonhouse doesn't seem to do that kind of math. Yeah. You know, he doesn't seem to be like, oh, that hurt. Right. I better start thinking about it. No, he's just. Munoz is a doer. It's all just triggers, you know, it's like instinct. Yeah. And so like John, if you're, if the choice is, we're going to be constantly exchanging at the exact same time, throwing a punch simultaneously. Who's going to excel in that kind of matchup? The guy who doesn't think and just keeps throwing the punches or the guy who we've never really seen him in that kind of back and forth fight. And he does seem a little more thoughtful. Maybe let, there's just too, yeah. too many layers on John's side. I mean, he's, he's a well put together young fighter, but that could be a problem against a guy like Munoz. Yeah. And if he doesn't like that kind of fight, then does he get predictable on his takedown right. entries and jump in for one? And then, Jump right. straight straight into Munoz's sub game, and we've seen that enough from Munoz that I'm kind of willing to bet on that. Like I'm not, not going to be like, oh well, he's going to play a sub game and get you know taken down and ground out for 
for 15 minutes. It's like, I don't, you know, that's not really what happens to Pedro Munoz. So it's all about the initiative. He gets you reacting to him. You screw up and you pay for it. So I, yeah, I got to take Pedro Munoz maybe by submission. Um, I just, we have to, this is kind of John's is meeting the upper ends of the division. He's fought hard enough and well enough and long enough that they're like, okay, here's the elite. And then it turns out you, you know, suddenly your game doesn't work. The game that was absolutely a pure uh, points crushing style game for the lower levels of MMA is suddenly laid bare at the elite level. I don't think Munoz is, I don't really like this matchup from like a, it's going to be a good fight, but from yeah. a matchmaking perspective, like I don't see Munoz as quite enough of a fringe up and comer. Like to me, Munoz is a fringe contender. M- like, Munoz to me is a, a top 10 gatekeeper. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 Mo- and John's just lost to like a current top five bantamweight. Like he should probably yeah. have taken a larger step back. I mean, the UFC uh-huh. doesn't do that, but no. ideally I would have liked to see him face somebody else who, like was maybe once seen as an up and comer and then was deferred. Somebody yeah. else who still has some potential, who's still going to test him and give him a tough fight, but we'll let him maybe work on some of the shit. Yeah. See him he face had... somebody like Eddie Wineland or Ronnie Yaya or somebody yeah. that's like a, a veteran kicking around the division now who has been beat by plenty of other prospects, but is not, you know. Yeah. I don't see the point of this because John's a, is a fighter with a lot of potential and, um, this season took like a very good chance of him losing two in a row after this. Yep. Uh, odds here, Pedro Munoz is the favorite. Opened at minus 155, adjusted down to minus 247. Is currently at minus 253. Not a lot of movement on that line after the initial adjustment. Brett Johns opened at plus 115, adjusted up to plus 186. Has gotten up to plus 214 and is currently dropping back down to plus 203. So... That feels right. I mean, honestly, if this is going to be a like Moonhouse, Moonhouse has a lot of ways to finish, and Johns has to play a perfect fight to win on points. So, yeah, Moonhouse feels like the safer bet. Yeah, it just feels like a tough matchup for Johns. That brings us to the main card of Featherweight Bout Cub Swanson, Hinato Moicano. And this is, I don't know. I, I, I feel bad for, like, my gut and my instinct and the tape, too. Like, it, it, everything has me picking Hanato Moicano. Mm-hmm. But I really do feel like Cubs should have a much better chance in this fight. I mean, like, the thing we've seen with Moicano, the biggest thing with Moicano on in Cubs' favor is that he tends to start slow and need to build his timing over... Yeah over the course of a fight. Like you look at his first round with Calvin Cater and his second round with Calvin Cater, and those are night and day rounds. Calvin Cater just came out and just absolutely cracked Hinata Moicano immediately out of the gate and then spent the rest of the round like landing good, long, straight punches, trading kicks, which was a mistake, but whatever. And you know, like mixing it up with him and hurting him and being in the fight in a very even dog fight. Then round two comes out and Hamada Mulikana's like, okay, I know all your timing now. Here are infinite counters and me circling away and I'm just going to like totally overwhelm and fill all opportunities with volume while you basically get fought out of this fight. Mm -hmm. And like that leaves a chance for Cub Swanson to do something early. Cub has the creativity. He has the ability to wade in. He throws a lot of different strikes. He can throw a lot of volume. The problem for Swanson is that he's never been a defensively responsible fighter. He has built-in moves that he can do to like, okay, I'm going to throw this punch and then I'm going to drop and I'm going to duck around and then I'm going to come back out. But it's not like I'm going to duck around because I know, like, here are the punches I see coming and I'm going to duck around them and move around them. It's like, no, that's, you duck and then you move and then you come back out. And people who are... The who, when he does make a, a decisive defense, like when he 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 flinches in response to something and, and makes a move reactively rather than one of those proactive moves, you can tell the difference. Like, he, yeah. 
He really flinches. He takes his eyes off his opponent. He really like he's never been super comfortable defending. Yeah, and it you know it means that even in a fight like against Artem Lobov, where he can land whatever he wants whenever he wants, he also gets hit whenever Artem Lobov wanted to hit him. Yeah, and it's it. Moicano has too much defense built into his style. He he throws some wild hooks backing up, but he's just a much more careful defensive fighter as an out fighter. He tends to, you know, he throws a lot of really hard kicks that are the kind of kicks that you take three or four of them and guys start switching stances and mm-hmm. backing off. And then his his defense and his defensive movement, like he's, Tends to just stay long, pick you off, move back and away. He circles out of the pocket as people come in. He's very good at adjusting off angles and things that just always keep him in a pretty responsible position, especially as the fight builds and he gets more comfortable. Now, we've seen against Brian Ortega that Ortega had a lot of success all fight, just continually never backing down and throwing a lot of power. Ortega just has a lot of natural snap and power to his strikes. So there's an opportunity for Swanson there, but I mean, I don't know. Swanson has been a knockout puncher in his time, but I don't really, I don't really feel like that's who Cub Swanson is anymore. Like, just there's a, a, a small level of speed that's no longer there that yeah. takes the surprise off of his strikes that mean that Cub Swanson's last knockout was Dennis Seaver in 2013. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, I gotta, you know, I think Swanson will probably come out, probably do well early, probably surprise Moicano early and put some hands on him as Moicano tries to get his timing and get into the fight. But over the second and third rounds, I, I feel like, you know, either Cub Swanson has to do what he did against Frankie Edgar and is like, Oh, I'm going to be very defensively responsible and just get out pointed. Or he fights a classic. I'm going to open up, be wild, be creative, throw a lot and get to hit a lot and just out, out pointed that way. Yeah, I'm 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 sympathetic to your your concerns because uh, it you know it's Cub Swanson. He's yeah. he's 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 still very good, and and we have seen recently like as disappointing as that set, that rematch with Frankie Edgar was, and and more disappointing because like nobody wanted or cared to see it. Yeah, like at least of all Cub, Cub didn't seem to really care that much either, and didn't really show up uh, to do anything he, he, different. He showed up with the the idea of I need to not get humiliated again, and so he like he came out with a game plan that was I'm going to stop Frankie Edgar from taking me down. That's what I'm going to do mm-hmm. at all costs. And he didn't get humiliated, but he just got exactly what up. happened in that first fight happened, which is once Cub started worrying about the takedowns. His his whole shit fell apart. Yeah, <laughs> he can't be Cub, just like Nick Diaz. He can't be Nick Diaz if he's super worried about being taken down. Um, so as disappointing as that was, we did see some of the best shit from Cub we've seen in that Brian Ortega fight. Yeah, uh, we saw some really nice work in the pocket. He, his jab uh-huh. was working. His counter left hook was was really really slick. Better head movement than we had yep. seen in fights before that. Uh, a lot of good looks. The difference between that and a guy like Wakano is just what the style of the matchup is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's where I start to think that Cub is, it doesn't have a huge chance here. Um, his his opportunity to snatch a win out of the air, as you pointed out, I think is less than it used to be. I do think he's missing that, that little bit of speed. I also just think that uh, fighters are better defensively now. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, there was that brief little period where Cub Swanson was knocking everybody out, but the guys he was knocking out, like, um, you know, I mean, yeah, there's some. I mean, Ross Pearson's a pretty good one, I guess. That featherweight, a weird one. And you know, uh, he knocked out Dennis Seaver, and he knocked out you know Charles Oliveira, and there, there's just not a lot of like great defensive fighters in there. No, um, there's not a lot of fighters who really have any idea how to defend punches. Uh, Moicano is not that kind of fighter, as you said. Defense is built into the way that he fights. It's all about distance management. His whole style. He he works behind a jab. Just like Jose Aldo, he will get a little wild and swing with you uh, if you get a little overconfident. And if you if he feels he needs to back you off, then he will swing a counter combination. But he doesn't get reckless with it. Um, 
more than I mean, it's a calculated risk every time. And he tends to reset. He's got great footwork, some of the best footwork in this division right now. Like very nice pivots, very, very good. Again, distance management is the whole thing. And so Cub is going to be in a kind of matchup where he has to close that gap and he has uh -huh. to get to Moicano. He's not going to be able to beat him at jabbing and kicking range. Uh, even though he can work at that range, Moicano's younger and better at those things. So can Cub Swanson be creative with combinations coming forward? Can he pressure and be tricky like that against somebody who's like Duha Choi is going to overreact and either brawl with you or fly backwards trying to get out of the pocket? Moicano's not going to do that. You're going to come swinging at him and he's going to jab and pivot 20 degrees to his left. And now you're going to, just like Ross Pearson against Cub, when he knocked him out way back in the day, you're going to go sailing past him as he steps very easily to the side. I just don't see this being a very forgiving kind of style matchup for Cub. He's definitely got a chance, but it's a lot more forgiving. Moicano can afford to make a lot more mistakes in this style of fight than Cub can. So I, 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 do, think think, Moicano, I, I do think that Cub will look good early, and I do think he'll maybe very likely win the first round. Just, how do you think he'll do it? I mean, what kind of what, how do you expect the first round to look? I, I expect the first round we'll see him stepping forward and throwing creative combinations and land like landing just enough of them, maybe even hurting Moicano very early with a shot that Moicano is just not in that first round as he tries to figure out what the timing is and what the speed is. I mean, like that's exactly what we saw with Calvin Cater. That's you know, the Moika he got started a bit quicker with Brian Ortega, but Ortega, as we've seen, as a striker, Ortega has a lot of natural skills, but it's been this evolution of, like, mm -hmm. here are some very particular technical things that Brian Ortega does really well that are being built into a very blank slate fighter who just kind of wants to square up and throw at people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so... Yeah, I mean, I think, like, the thing is, is that it does make me a little nostalgic uh, Cub Swanson, <laughs> just thinking of him for like the the days before there was so much tape study and yeah. there was just so much footage out there. He's such a great fighter for like a regional scene. He, he oh, has yeah. a great collection of bizarre tricks and all the swagger to the way that he throws his shots. But if you've had a chance to study Cub Swanson, I think a lot of his tricks are a little bit transparent. Like uh, oh, sure. he switches to Southpaw. What's Cub Swanson going to do? He's going to throw a big left body kick and literally everybody knows it. And that like, so yeah, I know what you mean, but as the fight goes on, it would really yeah. shock me if Moicano wasn't able to read those patterns. Yeah. That's what I say is I think Cub Swanson will have probably a pretty good first round. And then after that, it'll just be like, it'll be a bit like the Calvin Cater fight where we just saw like, there's a night and day switch between Hanato Moicano round one and Hanato Moicano round two. Yeah. And I think he may even come into his fights like expecting that. Like, oh, I'm going to see what they have to offer yep. first round. I'll take some licks. But he seems really like indefatigable. He seems very uh -huh. composed for such a young man. Um, and we've seen that now against like the Jeremy Stevens fight. If you expect yep. Mercano to be overalled by a more experienced fighter, then. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Uh, Swanson is a pretty sizable underdog like i said it's kind of, that's kind of why i feel like weird about this is it just a, it's so weird to think it's like oh he's he's a big underdog here like but it's just a tough matchup yeah um swanson's a pretty sizable underdog opened at plus 125 adjusted up to plus 313 and was trending down to about 306 jumped back up to 339 and is trending down again to plus 292 uh, Moicano opened at minus 165, dropped down to minus 361, and is just kind of bounced up and down a little. Is currently at minus 376, trending up and down in little bursts. Um, I, I mean, prob the biggest problem is really honestly that it's really hard to see Cub Swanson finishing this fight. Like I say, he's just not the dynamic finisher that he used to be. Mm -hmm. And if he's not finishing it, it's hard to see him work winning a footwork range battle. Yeah, absolutely. Sucks to see him as an, I mean, it happens eventually to all of our favorites, but yep. as you said, it's just a tough style matchup. Um, that brings us to our next bout. Pollyanna Viana, JJ Aldrich. Take it away. Hmm. Let me ask you a question, Zane. Yeah. Uh, how good is Polly Viana scoring takedowns? <laughs> How good is Pollyanna Viana at scoring takedowns? Uh-huh. Not good enough. Yeah. 
I mean, that's really the only question that matters in this matchup. Yeah, no. Is, can Pollyanna Fiona get JJ Eldridge down? Let the me put it like, this way. A win over Maya Stevenson means absolutely nothing. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, really the thing to say. The thing is that Aldrich has Aldrich has like she doesn't have the greatest statistics in terms of takedown defense in the world. Um she's you know, she she looked pretty good against Daniel Taylor. I can't remember how many shots Taylor attempted. It wasn't enough. Yeah, I mean it Daniel Taylor one. never does enough of anything. Um, <laughs> she attempted one and failed. Okay. Yeah. Um so you know, that's the thing is is Given given how good or or how not good Pollyanna Viana is on the feet, and how much her entire uh, relatively limited record up to this point has been based on submitting people, uh, submitting inexperienced opponents, JJ Aldrich has every opportunity so, to go on. Aldrich is the reason her stats on takedown defense don't look good mm-hmm. is that there she faced juliana lima in her first ufc fight oh okay okay and got taken down four times and juliana lima is one of the best fiana is not lima in that division yeah pauliana Viana is not juliana lima no uh, so yeah i mean jj aldrich is looking at viana striking aldrich can light her up on the yeah field. she can really just have her way with her aldrich has a has a really good jab uh, the big thing about Taylor, against Taylor, like she, she was pretty savage with the counter left hand. Mm-hmm. Um, she really looks like she's maybe kind of growing into her body and gaining confidence a bit. She and just at that that camp for her Taylor fight was her first time ever being a full time pro fighter. So it showed, man. It really yeah, showed. It did. She looked very confident, very poised, but really like athletically, she looked a step above where she had been before, and. Um, what is Viana going to do other than <laughs> try to like head arm throw her to the ground? Yeah, or, Viana's going to try to make this fight a mess. She's going to wing some wild hooks back and up. Yeah, she's going to hope her opponent takes her down so that they can get into a scrambling grappling match there. But it's a different kind of opponent than Taylor because I have a feeling that given trouble, Viana is going to try to force the issue. Is going to try to uh, to try to make her grapple. But as yeah. long as Aldrich doesn't like uh, accept a very poorly worded invitation to a brawl. <laughs> she she is gonna have every opportunity to just land her jab, land straight counters, maintain distance, and Viana is just slow and predictable and awkward with her striking. So yeah, yeah. No, I, like I say, I, I don't really understand why this fight is on the pay per view card or plan to be like. I like JJ Aldrich, but she's not an she's not a thrilling fighter. She's just a very composed, well schooled reasonably technical one who's getting better and she should she should smash Pollyanna Viana um Viana seems like she's a bit wild and she's you know was kind of like the best athlete in the circuit she was on when she was on it but otherwise there's not a lot of composure to Pollyanna Viana's game that would have me thinking that against a very composed opponent, she's going to make the right decisions and she's going to be the one to keep this fight where it needs to be. Um, despite the 10 and one record, you know, you're looking at zero and zero Pamela Ferreira and two and one Deborah Diaz and five and oh, Amanda Rebus, who's now in the OC and failed the drug test, I believe. Um, and just you know, there's uh, there's not the kind of quality there isn't indicative of much, other than maybe the Rebus win, which was a first round knockout. But um, Aldrich has been through much better competition, won better fights, been more composed, and just looks like a much better fighter. So hard to pick anything else. Odds on that fight, Aldrich is the favorite. Or no, Aldrich is the underdog, actually. What the fuck? Never mind. Aldrich is the underdog, opened at plus 160, got up to plus 251, and has since dropped back down steadily to minus or to plus 176. Sorry, I, that's surprising. So never mind. Viana opened at minus 210, dropped all the way down to minus 313, and has risen back up slowly to 256 before jumping to minus 216 
where she is right now. Uh, I, I am. I don't know what's going on with those odds, but man, read them again so I can hear them. Sorry, Pollyanna Viana currently is a minus two hundred and twenty favorite to JJ Aldridge <laughs> at plus one seventy, and has been as low as minus three thirty or three thirteen. What? I don't know. I mean, I <laughs> sorry to make you reread just so I could join you in your disbelief, but that is not good. Yeah, I mean, apparently they really love her wins over Pamela Fajera and Deborah Diaz and Maya Stevenson. Like I say, you know, Joe Mama, not the measuring stick of great athletic talent. <laughs> no, not exactly. So. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on with that Pollyanna. Well, this Viana is the good line. thing. This is the good thing with uh, the promotional exhaustion uh, fatigue of just having so many UFC events is that you have some real opportunities to make good bets because nobody knows what's going on or what wins mean anything anymore. You get one win on, yep. in the UFC or on Dana White's show, and boom, your yep. favorite. People, the, it's a lot. People are playing a lot more into hype now as they get more fatigued over actually watching fights. Mm -hmm. uh, middleweight bout coming up next: Tiago Santos, Kevin Holland. Tiago Santos is going to smash Kevin Holland unless something <laughs> miraculous happens, and Santos has one of those bed shitting moments like he did against uh, Eric Spicely, which honestly he blew his knee out anyway in that fight. So it's kind of even hard to take that too too seriously but kevin holland looks like a wild fighter who might be fun with like five more years of seasoning and that's about it yeah um the good thing about tiago santos for a matchup like this is that he is always on the cusp uh he he, he's he's not the most durable fighter ever no nope. stands bolt upright with his chin in the air and his head not moving at all uh, and just swings hooks when he's in the pocket. Uh, really wide, telegraphed kind of punches. The thing is, is that Kevin Holland has absolutely none of the skills to make those things an issue. Yeah, he um, does like, all the same things, but without yes. any of the the skills that make you go, oh my god, wow. Yeah. And and like, without without Tiago's like swagger. Ho Holland loves range kicking, so is he gonna have a range kicking battle with <laughs> Tiago Santos? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like Santos is just so much more dangerous. He's he's just a far more seasoned version of uh, of what Ke Kevin Holland is right now. And they spent, like you look at the way that Holland would come leaping in with like these weird single shots, his chin open, and just get countered with the laziest counter hooks. It's like yeah. Yeah, there could be a miracle. Santos is always wild. He's never, he's not the most durable guy in the world. Yeah, it's not like Colin doesn't have a puncher's chance, but he's not even a great puncher. No, so like I say, it's going to be like, what is he going to have a range kicking battle with Tiago Santos and win that war? Yeah, he's, That's he's not, probably that, getting that, that doesn't tend to be where Tiago Santos gets caught. Like, if you're going to be outside trying to outkick him, that's not where he gets his styles like gets mm -hmm. wild and broken down. Tends to be where he catches you. Yes, yeah, Santos is most likely going to murk Holland in the first round. Uh, Holland is opened at plus 215, jumped up as high as plus 315, and has gone down a little to plus 290, but that's about it. Tiago Santos opened at minus 275, dropped down to minus 396, and has plateaued out at about minus 373. He could be wider, honestly. I'd but Kevin Holland was on Dana White's show. Yeah. And he got a win. So and he didn't must even get a contract until three months later. E really? Yeah. He was on? on the first episode and then they needed a last minute replacement. So they yeah, brought okay. him in. Because they've already been given out too many contracts on that show. They have. They've been given out a lot. Uh all right. That brings us to a flyweight bout. Demetrius Johnson, Henry Cejudo. Connor, take it away. We're here. Uh, we finally made it. The co-main event. Uh, all right. This this fight is still exciting for all the reasons that we expected it to be an exciting matchup the first time around. Mm -hmm. uh, it feels a little more now like maybe Henry Cejudo is more prepared to actually bring those things to bear. I, I am incredibly worried about his scientific camp talk. Have you seen anything about that? Um, I saw Demetrius Johnson talking shit about it, but I, did, I didn't understand the context. 
he, so uh, Cejudo said uh, in an interview recently, like, oh, we're doing a really scientific camp, breaking down the, you know, like really going about it scientifically this time. They're measuring my omega waves. We're doing some magnetic, like, therapy and stuff. It's just like, bro. That's what you meant by science. Bro, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Cejudo comes in with, like, headphones on, but instead of walkout music, it's just, like, a low pulse that's supposed <laughs> to activate his frontal cortex. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, I don't know. Cejudo's a weird dude. He is a weird dude. I, I mean... You Tohudo know, it's really like overly earnest. Like Tohudo with a different set of parents would be like a like really into environmentalism. <laughs> Doesn't he strike you as that kind of person? Like just just give him different parents. He might be really into anything in a very strange, passionate, but mm -hmm. like yeah. I mean, well, and athletes way. athletes they love pseudoscience. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Uh, but <laughs> yeah. So all of that aside. Um, <laughs> I don't think any of that's going to, like, screw Henry Cejudo No, up. I mean, Henry Cejudo is an Olympic world champion, and he's a, a a very clearly, obviously great fighter who prepares really well. So yeah. you can't just be like, oh, he's into pseudoscience. He's trash. No. And and the big thing for him in, in his in his most recent fights uh, in the last three has been, like, confidence. Mm -hmm. He's looked so confident. And if he needs some stupid fooey to bolster his confidence, then who gives a shit? Yeah. Um. The thing is, is that last time, Henry Cejudo, I think, I mean, it was a wake-up call. I don't think he really yeah. thought that Demetrius Johnson was going to be the next level. I think he thought he was the next level, and yep. that it didn't require all that much extra effort to advance to the point where Demetrius Johnson was. And that was a very rude awakening for him. He was savaged by Demetrius Johnson. Mighty Mouse started hitting him with lead right hands. Those started leading into the clinch. And then the moment Mighty Mouse felt that uh, Henry's clinch, like his actual technical Muay Thai clinch fighting was not up to snuff, he just destroyed him with knees and elbows. Just had his way with him. And um, you can't be Henry Cejudo and go through that and come back for the rematch that you've worked hard for and not take the dude seriously this time. Yeah. And so if that's enough of a difference, like if that was what switched, flipped the switch from the Henry Cejudo we were seeing leading up to the first fight where it was like a lot of, it was work grade and athletic ability, but you know, maybe not like it's kind of like Holly Holmes run to the title. It didn't set the world on fire. It was just like, okay, he's in there. He's good. Compare it to the type of shit he's been doing since he yeah. lost to Demetrius Johnson. Yeah. He has been taking the fight to people. He has been trading bombs. He's been hitting big takedowns. Like they've either been wholly dominant performances or they have been like, Performances which Cejudo has ma made a point of showing that he's not going to back down. Yeah. Cejudo, Cejudo's first loss to DJ is the kind of, oh, this is the best thing possible for him. That loss that people, that the, the commentary team was on when Francis Ngannou stepped into the cage against Derek Lewis. And they're like, oh, yeah, that loss to Stipe. You're going to see a better Francis Ngannou than ever. Yeah. <laughs> he's just lost his, he's lost his confidence. Yeah. And then, but, yeah, it's exactly the opposite effect for yeah. Cejudo. He, and that's always what I've, I've, I, that even since day one of Cejudo's UFC career, that has always been my read on Cejudo is that he needs setbacks to get better. Like, yeah, I think it was the case in his wrestling career. And yep. he's, he's always been somebody who's known for like uh, being willing to rest on their laurels. Like, yep. I don't know that Henry Cejudo would ever be a great champion in the way no. that Demetrius Johnson is because once he gets comfortable, you don't see the best. But, He's not comfortable now. He has a goal to work towards, and we yeah. are seeing the best Henry Zahudo as a result. Uh, so what about the matchup changes as a result of that? Well, uh, Cejudo is going to be more comfortable, I think, dealing with uh, a range striking battle early. Uh -huh. I think he's going to be a lot more confident landing decisive shots, uh, which could mean he ends up pressuring a little more. I think he's got to be more prepared for the clinch. Uh, I don't still don't necessarily expect him to be like the superior clinch fighter. I, I've always seen him as somebody who, if um, if Demetrius Johnson needs to out wrestle his opponents to successfully pressure them, then uh, Cejudo can still be like a a bulwark against that because he's, yeah. he's at the very least very difficult to take down. Very I mean, he came out and he took Demetrius Johnson down right away in their first. Yeah. Fight. 
at the very least, he's he's difficult to outwork, control, take down in those positions. He's a, he's a good defensive wrestler, like passively, just yeah. because he's such a good wrestler. Um, so the question is, is like, what kind of fight does Demetrius Johnson fight this time around? And the thing is, is I I think Demetrius is still going to manage to pressure Henry Cejudo. I think we have seen more and more that that is the way that Demetrius Johnson likes to fight. He's been acknowledging it more himself too, uh, in his interviews recently. He's been like, mm, when that pressure gets on him. He's going to know that uh, nothing has really changed. And and that's the thing is, I don't know that Cejudo is, uh, he, he's going to have all this swagger and everything, but he is also going to, ex- he, we've seen two things out of him in these recent fights, right? We have seen him just beat the shit out of somebody who doesn't have a sense of their range, who doesn't have great defense, who doesn't have great durability. None of those things are true about Demetrius Johnson. Yeah. Um, he can take a shot. He can see shots coming. He adapts and responds better than anybody else in this sport. So, even if you do have striking success, it's not going to be like Wilson Hayes. You're going to have that success for a few minutes at most, and uh, things are going to start to change really quick. And then, so so that puts Henry in these matchups where, like, can he go to that next level after he has a good first start, a good start, a good first round, whatever? Can he adapt, uh, especially like defensively? Can he make it so that Demetrius Johnson cannot? Once Demetrius starts to avoid and then set up counters, what does Suhudo do after that? That's the level of depth that we have not yet seen from his striking. We have never seen it demanded of him. Uh-huh. Um, and the last time around that Demetrius Johnson demanded something of Suhudo that he couldn't, he didn't have yet, he fucked him up. Because <laughs> like Demetrius Johnson, I, I know you, everyone loves to talk shit about flyweights not being dangerous, but like you cannot give him, leave him an open door. And expect him not to try to finish you. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he's a he is a born finisher. I just think that he's going to bring the pressure on Cejudo. I'm expecting some engagements like we got in the Dodson fight, like uh, Johnson getting on a single leg and just holding on to it while Cejudo defends so he can chip away. And I expect that with each successive round, Cejudo is going to become a little frustrated. He's going to start to get hit and return more and isn't going to be able to evolve his approach. I think it's going to be like balls to the wall, top athletic uh, explosive kind of striking. The moment that stops working, I think we may be looking at something quite similar to the Kyoji Horiguchi fight, and that he just can't keep up with Johnson down the stretch. Mm-hmm. So, I'm hoping it's a little different. I would love to see Cejudo, Cejudo really push Johnson in every round, but I think he's going to be most dangerous at the beginning, and uh, Demetrius is going to figure him out like he does pretty much everybody. Yeah, if, if Cejudo has evolved his clinch enough to not get broken down there Mm. if he's put in the time and the work and the complexity into that part of his game that even if he can't be a great offensive force there if he can just force separations and stop demetrius johnson there i can see henry cejudo winning this fight just off of like youth and endurance and power and and DJ is not the greatest defensive striker in a row no, either. No. He's been popped in several fights. And mm-hmm. Cejudo is a much more dangerous athlete standing than or this version of Cejudo is than probably anybody back to Dodson. You know? For for DJ. It is a much more consistently composed fighter than John Dodson. Yeah. So but when is Cejudo? The question is like, when has Cejudo? When have we ever seen him face somebody who takes that initial advantage away from him? John Joe Benavidez challenged his advantage, and 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 yep. neither man backed down, and both Wilson Hayes and, and Sergio Pettis couldn't really no. uh, successfully challenge. But Demetrius Johnson is gonna find a way. Given time, will find a way to take away Cejudo's success. So how does he get back to it? Yeah, We've and I mean, like the thing. So, like the thing is, I can see, I could envision, my gut can feel a way for Henry Cejudo to win this fight. There's no way on God's green earth that I can pick Henry Cejudo to win this fight. Like oh, that's okay. that's just what it is. Beating and like out wrestling and out working Sergio Pettis on the mat and knocking out Wilson Hayes, like they just don't say enough. Yeah. And Cejudo, like, the big thing about the Pettis fight is that Cejudo striking looked really frustrated in that fight. 
you know? I he think got, the pressure of Pettis gave him tr trouble. That's why I'm like, uh, Demetrius is going to start coming up with yeah. answers pretty quickly. Pettis has a range that Demetrius Johnson does not have. That yeah. was a big part of it, is that Pettis was able to just stick Cejudo out on the end of longer strikes True. that uh, Cejudo then couldn't find a way around because he doesn't... Cejudo's, you know... His his legs are the length of his arms, and all of it is like you know squished down to like mini proportions. Yeah, he has thirty percent more hair height than the average man, but all yeah. of that comes out of his legs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like there's no range game for Cejudo that's not jumping into the pocket with a big yeah. strike. He just doesn't have striking defense. Like yeah. this is still a massive thing in MMA that just tons of guys like that's why Israel Adesanya can show up and even against a good technical striker like Brad Tavares, you're like, holy shit, this is what striking can be. Yeah, and Cejudo, Cejudo is a prime example of that. He's made all these leaps and bounds in his striking technique and his confidence, but when it comes down to it, he's not a good defensive striker. Yeah. So how does he get around those punches? He doesn't know how. Yeah. You know. And you know, for for Johnson, like I say, he doesn't have the range of somebody like Pettis, and he does tend to be a bit right hand happy. So there are, you know, there there are stri striking limitations standing for Demetrius Johnson that mean that we could get a crafty movement heavy range game that doesn't have a lot of thrilling singular moments but where DJ just kind of like picks the better pot shots when he gets them and Cejudo ends up chasing and frustrated but yeah I mean it, it's really it's on Cejudo to prove that if he can get takedowns he can turn takedowns into offense or to prove if Demetrius Johnson can get back to the clinch, that his clinch game is improved enough to not just get shit kicked there. Mm -hmm. And then otherwise he's got to show that on the feet he can keep up, that he can be defensively, more defensively responsible and more offensively diverse. And, you know, like I say, beating Wilson Hayes doesn't prove that. It's a great win, and he looked great doing it, but his stand-up then did not look great against Sergio Pettis. Like, he didn't look like this whole new level of evolved stand-up fighter in that fight. He was better than Sergio, but it wasn't because he was a better striker. Yeah. He took he took a early and he took early advantage of the fact that Wilson Hayes is, for the first three minutes of every fight, super uncomfortable striking. And Hayes never, ever got into that fight. Hey, well, I mean, you could look at that fight from a mile out and just be like, Wilson Hayes is going to get mauled. Yeah, it's a good style matchup for him. That's yeah. the thing. We, Demetrius Johnson isn't. No. So, so yeah, I, can, I have a gut feeling of like Henry Cejudo is still like he is the most athletic, most purely athletic and gifted and singularly gifted in an area of the fight up and coming prospect. You know, there's nobody else in that division with his combination of, or not even prospect at this point, he's the most singularly gifted contender, where it's, he's, not only is he an elite athlete at the level of Demetrius Johnson and Kyoji Horiguchi and the, you know, maybe Ray Borg, a couple other, the, the other handful of incredibly elite athletes at the top of that division, but he is a wrestler at a level that is Beyond the level that Horiguchi is a karateka, that is beyond the level that Ray Borg is a grappler. You know, he's got a huge skill, a wealth of skill, talent in one area. Mm -hmm. So there, I can, I have that gut feeling of like, yeah, he could do this, but I would have to see it. it like, <laughs> I can't just bet on that. There's no Chris Weidman, Anderson Silver. We haven't seen, we've seen no signs that there's slippage from Demetrius Johnson. No. There's just, and, and unlike the first fight between Anderson Silver and Chris Weidman, we have seen Demetrius Johnson win this fight before. It's, yeah. how, how are you going to pick against the man? No. Odds on the fight uh, Johnson is a heavy favorite. Opened at minus 464, dropped down to minus. Uh, 556 and then got down as low as minus 590 but has risen ever since up to minus 490 
So some money coming in on Cejudo was DJ gets to really wide odds. Cejudo started at plus 336, adjusted up to plus 410, got up as high as plus 424, and has dropped down steadily to plus 366 since then. That that all seems fair to me. Anything beyond that, and you just start to get into like, this is a crushing mismatch odds, and it's not that. Yeah. It's just, you know, a fight where you you are illegally required to pick Demetrius Johnson. That's yeah, all. pretty much. Brings us to our main event, a Bantamweight fight, TJ Dillashaw, Cody Garbrandt. And this is a fucking fight, man. Mm-hmm. How do you – I want I want to ask you about their first one because um, people are still talking about it. It's like, man, that was one of the best Bantamweight fight. Not a lot happened. Yeah, it was a I mean, pretty slow fight. Like, how do you feel about their first fight? What did you learn from it? Does it do the things think it's- that I learned from it, and that okay, but like most of my tape study for this, honestly, was watching them fight each other, and then watching, watching their, them uh, both fight Dominic Cruz. Oh, I thought you were gonna say watching them play tetherball on the Ultimate Fighter. No, <laughs> <laughs> but watching them fight each other and watching them both fight Dominic Cruz. Yeah, and I think they show a very particular thing that has a chance to play out in any infinite number of variations, honestly. Because what you saw in the first fight to me and what you can see out of their fights with Cruz is that nobody in that division is as fat, has the combination of speed and power that Cody Garbrandt does. Undeniable. And that's really what makes... Cody Garbrandt is that he is marvelously, remarkably fast. Hand speed, but I mean everything, but hand speed that's almost unparalleled in the yeah. sport. Like he's got such quick, powerful punches. And so when he fought Dominic Cruz, what you saw was that a very special. Like Cruz's game is it's dependent on a lot of trickery, a lot of footwork trickery, but it's otherwise really dependent on speed. Because Cruz, a lot of what he does is there's a lot of movement from outside, a lot of switching and all that. And then he finds the angle he wants to enter in. He jumps into the pocket. He throws one or two strikes, often big kind of looping strikes. And then he dips out. And sometimes it's on, sometimes it's, you know, he'll take an angle out. And oftentimes he'll also just just drop right back out. He's gotten better about taking angles out as he's gone on in his career. And against Garbrandt, what is pretty obvious in that fight is that when he picked his spot and dropped into the pocket, he was just never faster than Cody Garbrandt. Yeah. And it was an unsolvable problem for Dominic Cruz. Because Dominic Cruz's game, like, there's no... It's weird to think of, but there's not a, a really a range component to Dominic Cruz's striking game. You know, he's got. Thing is, like, is that's a that's a matchup I think that Dominic Cruz could very well win uh, if they were to rematch. I just think he didn't take the right approach. Like he 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 got be. hurt and doubled down very quickly in on yeah. the idea that he had to pressure Cody Garbrandt, which was exactly what was making Cody effective. Yeah. If if Dominic just wait just didn't let Cody counter, like just waited on him and just touched him with kicks from long well, that's, range. That's what I mean. Is it like Dominic Cruz he does like, have good kicks. He's got good kicks. He's got some good kicks, but he's not like a sit down on kicks outside and just do that. Like he's no, still it would have taken a real a real like different game plan he would have had to say okay i'm not going to do this as my response to ending up in trouble i'm going to just take the fight out of the fight and just pick apart yeah he could have done that though because what is what is cody going to do other than just counter dominic coming in yeah but it was he's fast enough that you know for dominic cruz the game dominic cruz likes to play the game he wants to play is i drop into the pocket i surprise you i get out of the pocket and then I find another area, I look around, I wait outside, I hop, I go back and forth, and then I drop into the pocket. I surprise you, I get out of the pocket. And he is used to, like, he couldn't, t- he wasn't taking Cody's vision away. Yeah. He wasn't distracting him. So, like, as long as Cody sees him coming, even Dominic Cruz's angles are, like, 
his his chin's right there. Yeah, <laughs> it's just him. I mean, the other thing of Dominic Cruz's game has been always that he's actually been a pretty 50-50 striker with a lot of people over his career, sure. and then he has an incredible wrestling game to back it up. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, okay, well, I you know I'm surprised I'm keeping you guessing enough that you can't seriously hurt me. And that we can keep this pretty even and I look good doing it because I'm the one moving and frustrating you. And then I'm going to, I'm going to get a takedown and I'm going to get some control that allows me to then take a round that's otherwise close. And so with Dillashaw, what you saw in the Dillashaw fight is Dillashaw just constantly needing to adjust and not getting anything to adjust to. Right. Because Dillashaw's game is all about adjustment. It's all if... about what do I see? What am I getting? How can I build off that? How can I make my style go from something that's just kind of a wait and faint and look and get, you know, whatever kickboxing game? I'm doing that until I find what's the part that works. Mm -hmm. And with Dominic Cruz out there looking and waiting and fainting and dropping into the pocket and throwing a weird surprising strike and then getting out of the pocket. Dillashaw, even the, even though the fight was a pretty 50-50 even striking battle, he never was able to adjust to the way that Dominic Cruz was approaching him because he doesn't have the speed to do what Cody Garbrandt does and just sit and be like, okay, I'll wait till you drop in and I'll just pick you the fuck off because I'm faster. You can't surprise me. And when they fought each other, what you see right out of the gate is Cody Garbrandt comes out and he shocks TJ Dillashaw with speed, yeah. with pure speed and power plants him early and just totally takes him out of the fight you know immediately hurts him because he's much faster mm -hmm. and then what you see as the time goes on is tj dillashaw adjusts he says okay well what works you know Ludwig's like just throw kicks at him he doesn't like garbrandt you know we talk about like brett johns not having a range component to his game like Garbrandt doesn't throw kicks. That's the real question is like, we asked this on heavy hands this week. Um, how good is Cody Garbrandt? <laughs> like we still don't like how much, how flexible is he? Yeah. I guess a really good question is like, what, what does he do other than a right hand and a left hook? Mm -hmm. And, but the thing is, is that he's so fast that it, it doesn't matter. Like when you're that fast, you don't need a lot of diversity in there. Yeah. And he's got great timing and he does really have like good eyes. Like oh yeah, the, the defense he showed against Dominic Cruz, we were all shocked because we'd never seen it from him before. But um, that's the same like base talent or ability that allows you to be a great counter puncher is like he, he just sees everything coming and adjusts really, really well on the yep. fly. Yep. But how creative can you be in that kind of style is as yeah. I asked the question. And you know, he he has a slamming takedown game we've seen before that he can pull out every now and then, but it's not like a, oh, Cody Garbrandt's going to take you down and like ride you and just put on this right. dominant wrestling performance. He can, it's something he can kind of throw into his arsenal, but it's not something he can really throw in against TJ Dillashaw. What, what you pretty much have is you have a similar thing where Dillashaw, to his credit, much more than Dominic Cruz, Dillashaw drops into the pocket like Cruz. He tends to move around a lot and select an angle, look for an opportunity, look for a feint, look for a place to drop into the pocket. And then he moves, tries to move around you in the pocket. He tries to set his feet and he tries to move around, which is frankly what got him caught early against Garbrandt because Garbrandt was, he was like, oh, you're just going to sit down in the pocket and then try to like actually work? I'll just fucking crack you really, really hard. <laughs> But the other side of that is that once TJ Dillashaw hurt Garbrandt and got him thinking about kicks, thinking about a kicking game, thinking about having to deal with an arsenal at range where he didn't have a range game to counter it, didn't have something to pick up what Dillashaw was doing, Garbrandt looked notably worried in that fight after he got hit by that head kick. Like, he just looked flustered. Mm. And so the next time Dillashaw dropped into the pocket after that, he was able to actually, like, the fact that he wants to sit down and move around his opponent and throw power, yeah. he caught Garbrandt and knocked him out. So you have Dillashaw, who's, like, Dillashaw is going to likely play with a little fire again, 
but I got to pick him just because the long-term adjustment is always going to favor him until we see Garbrandt have to adjust and then adjust. Mm -hmm. Because what we saw in the Dillashaw fight the first time was Dillashaw had to adjust. He adjusted. He won. Garbrandt had to adjust. He didn't adjust. He got really frustrated, and he lost. Yeah. And, I mean, there, Garbrandt, with his speed and power, always has a chance to pick Cody or to pick TJ off at any point. TJ is going to – like, I don't expect TJ Dillashaw to just come out and, like, throw only kicks or even for that to work necessarily. I expect that Garbrandt will, you know, be ready to push forward off of kicks, like when he sees them coming or to – better. Yeah, if he doesn't, that that's like a it's like a big problem he struggled with last time. He better. Yeah. I mean, we are going to learn how well Cody Garbrandt can deal with like loss or yeah. How how well does he come in with a game plan to address the singular flaw that right. opened up last time? Yeah, but I and I expect he'll have done something. Like Team Alpha Male is not a bad camp for preparing people. It's not like they're just not going to see it and figure anything out. But it's a question of Dillashaw's, you know, like, that's not all Dillashaw does. He's a, got a whole series of adjustments he tries to go through and make during fights. And as we saw against somebody like Cruz, Cruz just never gives you an adjustment point. He never gives you something where you're like, ah, there's how I adjust to Dominic Cruz. It's always like, what, what weird shit is he doing now? God damn it. And... Garbrink gives you... Yeah, the same adjustment point over and over. Yeah, exactly. And it's wide open. Yeah, yeah. it's it, it's interesting to look at like the the style the style matchup at these these top three guys, how they match up differently with each other. I really uh -huh. still believe that if Dominic Cruz did more of what he did against T.J. Dillashaw, he could beat Cody Garbrandt. Um, the problem is that against Garbrandt, like he he couldn't. He got impatient. Like he had to make something happen. That's what Dominic Cruz does against Dillashaw. He was forced into being more of a pot shotter and counter puncher, um, and forced into drawing the exchanges more because Dillashaw started the fight giving him more, and Garbrandt started the fight with Cruz giving very little. Um, so that yeah, that like the the part where Cruz and Dillashaw overlap is where Garbrandt makes is dangerous for TJ because in the same way TJ will given a a reticent opponent will take the invitation to come in and start making things happen he's an aggressive fighter uh -huh. um that's just in his nature more so than cruz yeah uh, that doesn't mean that he's he's better at it uh, than cruz but also he is going to be walking into that danger zone that's just how his style works he's yep. going to be presenting his chin for those counters um the thing is is like I mean, I really, I don't want, I don't want to uh, legitimately use their tetherball match as analysis, but like it does ring true with what played out in their fight, and I expect it to ring true with their rematch as well, because what happened on the Ultimate Fighter when they played tetherball is that Cody Garbrandt got the game immediately, uh, and scored like six, seven points to like one or two from Dillashaw, was just about to win. And then Dillashaw kind of figured out how it worked. He started to be like, okay, here is where. Cody's tiny little arms won't let him reach the ball. If I hit it up this high, I don't know what adjustments he was making in his head, but he adjusted and then dominated down the stretch and, and got all the way up to just his 10 points. And that's kind of what happened in the fight. I mean, it wasn't that played out, but had some trouble, figured out what the problem was, made a change, and it was clear Garbrandt could not adjust to Dillashaw's adjustment the way that Dillashaw adjusted to the initial problem. And... um I think that'll be true in a rematch as well. Dillashaw is just a more thoughtful fighter. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to call Cody dumb here. I mean, would, I would never dare to imply that Cody Garbrandt is not the most intelligent fighter on earth. But Dillashaw is a thinker. It's built into his style. It is not – Cody Garbrandt, it seems to be all about that first layer of just that mm -hmm. trigger and get that reaction off. Um, and Dillashaw will invite – that trigger and he will suggest it and then do something else. And then when you start to second guess that he'll give you something else you have to react to. So you forget about what he did to the trigger before. And then he catches you. There's just layers that he can mm -hmm. build upon. Uh, and I don't know, like it's, it's going to be an interesting fight to find out if Cody 
he has any of that, if he's capable of taking it to the next level, he may in fact be like, he's always going to be dangerous because he's so fast and so powerful. Yeah. And he does have a really good base set of boxing skills, yep. especially the, the footwork and the defense are going to come in handy against the vast majority of opponents. He's not. a technically clean fighter and the one of the absolute best athletes in the UFC. Yeah. But so, it feels like his way of fighting is very contained. Yeah. Um, and if you're a fighter like Dillashaw, you can corral him and be like, how long does it take TJ Dillashaw to figure out that after the right hand is coming a left hook or vice versa? There's just not enough there to like, once Dillashaw feels that he can time the, the trigger, it's 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 his day. He it's it's his game. He gets to play with Garbrandt's expectations. Garbrandt needs to show more layers in this fight that he can play with Dillashaw's expectations. That Dillashaw tries to tease the trigger and then something else totally unexpected comes out, and that could change everything. I mean, Garbrandt yeah. may have the capability, but we have not seen it up to this point. Um, granted, we didn't see what he did in the cruise fight up to this point either, but I think in retrospect, it does look like the style matchup there that Cruz kept accepting the invitation to come into the pocket, but was not uh, giving Garbrandt the kind of expect. He just couldn't react to his speed, and he wasn't. Cruz can't fight in layers in mid range the way that Dillashaw can. Mm -hmm. Dillashaw is going to be able to come up with pocket responses to those counters. Cruz just had to like try to be tricky from long range where Garbrandt is seeing everything coming. Yep. So yeah, I think it's it's hard not to go with Dillashaw once again. He won the last fight. Um, I think he's the kind of fighter who will excel in a rematch much more so than Cody, but it may also just not matter because Cody Garbrandt is so dangerous and he yep. was a little, I mean, he, it wasn't like that close, but he hurt Dillashaw last time. He shocked him. And yeah. the thing, the thing is too, Dillashaw might be the smarter fighter, but his thing with Cody is that no matter how much more intelligent uh, Dillashaw may be, he can never resist arguing with Cody Garber. <laughs> yeah, he, he can he never always, resist wanting to like pr pr prove that he's right. just better in every right. everything. You can say, okay, this guy's a dumbass, but like, um, I can't stop arguing with the dumbass because I have to prove him wrong. Like, I think that's actually the best part of the dynamic between <laughs> Dillashaw, Garbrandt, and Cruz yeah. is that all three of them are like that against one another. <laughs> yes. is it, that's the thing with the Cruz fight. I think yes. Cruz just can't accept, like, no, this guy is just faster than me, and if I drop in and try to challenge him in the pocket, he's always going to hit me first. It's like, no, no, I'm just better than this guy. This guy's an idiot. Yeah. You know? So the thing is, is like Dillashaw does have an ego. Um, yeah. And he, no matter how easy it should be for him to just dismiss whatever stupid shit, Garbrin can say the dumbest shit on earth. He'll be like, uh, you know, don't matter. I'm going to knock him out. And Dillashaw is like, I have to respond to this. Yeah. It's like, just stay quiet. He can't. So seeing that and also seeing what he did in the Burrell rematch where he really came out trying to like, beat Burrell up and got in trouble as a result, yeah. it's quite possible he comes in here looking to send a message and suffers the consequences. You don't know. Garbrandt might bring out the worst in Dillashaw rather than the best. So, we'll see. Picking Garbrandt, or picking Dillashaw, but always you can't yeah. discount Garbrandt because there's clearly, like, like I say, I mean, there's a level of technique and athletic ability there that just mean, like, he doesn't have to be that evolved. He doesn't have to be evolving all the time to be a constant problem. Right. Not at all. Cody Garbrandt is a very, very mild underdog. Opened at minus 105, adjusted up and down to minus or to plus 111, and got down, uh, stayed right about even there, and then has dropped lately from plus 108 all the way down to minus 104. So. Really dead even odds. Dillashaw opened at minus 135, adjusted up and down to about minus 130, and has slowly trended upwards pretty consistently to minus 120. So, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think Dillashaw deserves to be a reasonable favorite. I think he could be a little more of a favorite than that, but I also don't, you know, he can't be a much bigger favorite than that, yeah. clearly because their first fight had two moments that could have been knockouts and just one of them was. Yep. You know, it's, uh, could have happened to Dillashaw and that's clear. So he can't be. Yeah, and it, I mean, it may be that Dillashaw will every time need something to adjust to. Like he will need something that will like 
scare him enough to fi- to move off to another game. Yeah, and Garbrandt even more so than Barrow is like like those exchanges that Dillashaw allowed himself to get in at the end of the first round in the rematch with Barrow. Like you do not want to be getting in those exchanges with Cody Garbrandt. Maybe yep. if you have more layers and 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 Garbrandt just has the two shots, but dangerous. Yeah, really Very dangerous. dangerous. Anyway, on that note, you can find me on Twitter at these Zane Simon. You can find Connor on Twitter at BoxingBush, B-U-S-C-H. You can find both of us over at BloodyElbow.com, day in, day out. And on, uh, we'll be back, let's see, next week, is it? For UFC Fight Night. No, we have a week off, at least. My God. <laughs> I think we even maybe have uh, two, two weeks. weeks off. Two weeks off. We have two weeks off before KG versus Vic. Think of all the bad fights we get to watch, Zane. Yeah, that's right. So we'll be back next week with the MMA Depressed Us. And uh, that, of course, is on MMANation.com, our YouTube channel, D-O-T-C-O-M, all spelled out. So you find all the latest Bloody Elbow shows, interviews, videos, analysis, all that stuff we do. So subscribe to that. Give this video a like, thumbs up down there on YouTube. That helps us a ton. And uh, we will be back soon. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in.